The burden that the patient with polycythemia vera experiences is heterogeneous, but can be problematic. Our group has been very engaged in trying to quantify that burden. It includes many aspects. It includes a risk of thrombosis or bleeding, but as well as many symptoms that can be related with difficulties with blood flow related to the high counts. And this can be everything from TIAs to sensory changes, erythromyalgia, headaches, even more subtle things such as difficulties with concentration, uh, insomnia, uh, challenges with intimacy. So a whole spectrum of things we really associate with really inadequate blood flow. They can have a strong impact of fatigue. And that can be very multifactorial. That may be treatment related, that may be related to iron deficiency from phlebotomies, but some of it is inherent to the disease itself, related to probably abnormal cytokines that are elevated uh, in the disease. They might have symptoms from enlargement of the spleen, uh, and that might cause fullness, discomfort, uh, or pain. Polycythemia vera can cause a range of complications. Indeed, just this week, I had seen two individuals that had had uh, thrombotic events to the abdominal veins, uh, what we call Bud Chiari syndrome. Uh, and that, like blood clots in any of the vascular distributions, not only can cause symptoms, but can really cause long-term uh, risk and complications for the patient in terms of their hepatic health, or patients that have had uh, sinus venous thrombosis in the skull, and that can lead to difficulties with headaches. Individuals can have had uh, pulmonary emboli and have pulmonary hypertension, deep vein thrombosis, and have chronic edema. So there's a range of, of impact that they can have had from having had thrombosis or bleeding, in addition to the spectrum of the other disease-associated symptoms we can encounter. Polycythemia vera is the blood condition that makes cells grow without control. The main problem is elevation in the red blood cells. But many patients can also have a high white cells and high platelets. Some may have enlargement in the spleen. It's not very common, but it's possible. And too many blood cells in the circulation cause many problems. That would be particularly circulation in the small vessels, so problems with the circulation in extremities, memory problems, visionary problems, hypersensitivity of the skin, and the blood clotting. Many patients with polycythemia vera actually present already with a blood clot at the time of diagnosis. So these are the factors, the symptoms of a circulation impairment leading to circulatory problems, blood clots, which can be trivial, perhaps in a finger, but also in a belly or a heart or a brain, and abnormalities in blood cell count without any symptoms. Any of these would lead one to suspect polycythemia vera. The most recent diagnostic criteria for polycythemia vera are the WHO 2016 criteria. And the main changes in those criteria over the past is a lower threshold for erythrocytosis, realizing that as a continuous variable, any number that we pick as a threshold will uh, impact sensitivity and specificity depending upon how up or down we go on that value. But individuals need unexplained erythrocytosis and the presence of a mutation. And if this is the case, they likely have P. vera. In addition, new diagnostic criteria do mandate a bone marrow aspirin biopsy. That criteria has been somewhat controversial. I do think that it is very helpful as a baseline. Uh, one may be somewhat confident of the diagnosis even without bone marrow histology. However, I do think that it has value, particularly in younger patients, as we like to get a baseline assessment of their cytogenetics, any baseline degree of fibrosis, uh, as well as to be certain there's no increase in blast at a baseline. There continues to be discussion around these diagnostic criteria particularly given the issue of how much erythrocytosis is necessary for diagnosing the disease. This is for a variety of reasons. One, it is sometimes found that by a red cell mass, uh, erythrocytosis is present, uh, and that it is not obvious just with measurement of the hematocrit, that these two things uh, can be somewhat uh, unrelated. Second, the impact of iron deficiency has a variable impact on the degree of erythrocytosis that can mask erythrocytosis in terms of developing the disease phenotype. Now the JAK2V617F is a very important part of that diagnostic process. We recognize in 2017 
that the vast majority of patients with PVR will have JAK2V617F present. There is a much smaller number, 3%, 5%, that will have the JAK2 exon 12 mutation. Many commercial laboratories now will evaluate both in sequence in that diagnostic process. They'll check the V617F first, but if your diagnostic goal is to exclude polycythemia vera, they will typically reflex to then check the JAK2 exon 12. They are mutually exclusive, so there is really no great value in checking both simultaneous. It's better to do it as a reflex test. Elevation in the blood cell count, particularly red blood cell count, can exist without any disease in the bone marrow. Bone marrow is the organ that is sensitive to insults to a body. Like in a case of a platelets, the platelets can be high because of iron deficiency. A red blood cells can be high because of lung problems, for example. If one has a sleep apnea or is heavy smoker, the lungs are unable to process enough oxygen for a body to function normally and therefore the bone marrow will produce too many red blood cells. That can be secondary to a relatively benign condition. It's not malignancy. There are other conditions. Some are hereditary abnormalities in the sensing of the oxygen or producing of the cells in the bone marrow. Or some tumors of the solid organs, like a kidney problem, can cause elevation in red blood cell count. All of these factors need to be taken into consideration when we suspect polycythemia vera.